Hello, good morning and good evening. My name is Asada, and in this episode of Map Making Academy for Flood Escape 2, I'm going to be giving you guys all the tools you'll be using to make your Flood Escape 2 map. This includes installing and using Roblox Studio, going through the map making kit, and towards the end of the video, I'll be giving you guys a few tips and tricks to make the map making process a little bit easier. With all that ahead of us, let's get started. If you don't have Roblox Studio installed, it's pretty easy to install. First, you want to go to Roblox and make sure you're logged in. By the way, this only you can only get Roblox Studio on desktop. You're not going to be able to do this on mobile. Although, if this changes in the future, I will definitely update the tutorial. Then, you want to go to the Create tab on the top. And it will take you to either your only game or all the games that you've made previously. What you're going to want to do is simply click on the Edit button and it will bring up a prompt that will allow you to install Roblox Studio. After that, you should get the desktop icon. And what you're going to want to do is just open it up. For the first time you're opening it up, it will probably ask you to log in once again. But otherwise, it'll take you to a page like this, which gives you access to any recent files you've had, any games that you have on Roblox. But for this tutorial, we're simply going to want to start by making a basic base plate. The base plate will give us a large work surface to start just experimenting. So up at the top, we have all the buttons and the tabs that we're going to need. Most of the time, we're going to be spending our time and effort in the model tab but we can switch around and just see what other options we have. So to start, if you want to create a part, you can either click on this block right here, or you can click the drop down tab if you want a different type of part. Say I want like a triangle, I'll put that there too. And pretty much what this does is it creates parts that are affected by gravity if you do it in that way. So for example, if I bring it up right here, and I go to test, when I eventually load into the game, I'll see that the parts fall to the ground like that. We don't want this when, with our map because otherwise all of the parts would simply fall out of the world. So what we're going to do is highlight these and in the model tab we're going to want to click on anchor. It's a little bit hard to see but if it's darker it's selected. And what this allows us to do is make parts that are not affected by gravity. So you can jump on them, you can try to do whatever but they're not going to move at all. See, they're stuck in the air. Other things you can do with parts would be changing their material. So say I want this wedge to be, let's make it out of wood planks. So there we go. We change the material. We want to change the color. We do a similar thing. You can either do the drop down tab right here, or you can go to your properties tab and edit it from there. I want to make this a night bright yellow. So we'll make it yellow. The next, up in the top left, we have the five cursors we'll be using throughout editing the parts. First, the select cursor allows us to simply select parts and look at their properties. We'll be going over these tabs in just a second. We can also click and drag the parts to move them wherever we want. Next is the move tab, which similar to the select tab, we can also drag it around. We can actually drag it around for every single tab or every single cursor up here. We can simply click on the part and drag it around. But what move allows us to do is more precisely move our part in one of the three axes. See in the top right here we have a little icon that shows us what each axis is pretty much. So we can see that the red one, the x-axis, is left to right. The green one is up and down, that's the y-axis. And front to back is the z-axis, that's blue. For the scale tool, it allows us to edit the proportions of our parts. So if I don't want the part to be very short, I can make it taller by scaling it upwards. Maybe I want this wedge to be a lot longer, so I'll bring it over here. And let's say I want this to be super duper thin, so I'll bring it in closer and now it's a really thin wall. Rotating is pretty simple to grasp. You get three of the you get one little hoop for each of the axes and you get to rotate it anywhere you like along those. And finally, we have the transform tool, which is pretty much a combination of all the previous ones. It, give, it also gives us a nice little grid at the bottom that shows us exactly how big our part is compared to the studs on the ground. And we can grab the corners to increase or decrease the scale size. 
We can use these arrows right here to rotate it. And if we want to move it, we can either drag it around and it won't go downwards at all. Like with the with the regular move tool, this will snap it to any specific object. But with the transform tool, it'll keep it in place in the air. And if we want to move it up or down, we have these arrows right here. We can move it up or down with that. So when using any of these tools, there's two really important settings that we have, which are called the rotate and the move snaps. So what the what these allow you to do is when you are editing things with the scale or the move or the rotate keys, it pretty much snaps it to any increment of these. So if we see if we peek to the properties right here, we can see that the size of this block is four in the X direction, 10 in the Y direction and 3.5 in the Z direction. If I change my move snap to let's say two, so it'll only go two up or two down whenever I scale it or move it. So you can see down here, it's 10. If I bring it up by one snap, it'll be 12 now. Two, three, four. We can bring it two, three, four times two, which would be eight. So 10 plus eight is 18. If we want to uncheck this, we actually get a free form move. It doesn't snap to any grid. But the problem is you can see that towards the bottom, the number gets a lot more uneven and messy. So generally when you're making a map, you're going to want to keep it to a pretty decent sized snap. I like to use 0.25 studs, so one quarter of a stud. I've seen 0.1, I've seen 0.5. I just honestly like working with 0.25 the most. The same thing goes for rotate. Say I only want to rotate my part 45 degrees at a time. Well, I go to rotate. You can see I can only do it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight turns. If I want to make it a free rotate, I can also do that. But again, that creates some pretty uneven shapes. I personally like to keep it at 15. Now we have some other little features that are often overlooked in studio. Most of them you're not gonna want to use. So up here we have the collisions, constraints, and join surfaces options. For pretty much all of these, you're gonna to wanna to keep them turned off because the collisions button will pretty much force objects to be stuck outside of one another when you place them. Or at least that's what it says it does. The constraints button will let you see stuff like welds, which we're not really going to be using because all of our parts are going to be anchored. And join surfaces, when you move parts on top of each other, it actually creates welds. But the problem is when we do a bunch of welds like this, it can create additional lag and just having the parts be unanchored is much better. So you want to make sure all three of these are turned off. Next, the lock button pretty much makes it so that certain objects are unselectable. So if I lock this right here, I'm clicking on it right now and I cannot select it at all. By default, this is how the base plate is. So you don't accidentally click on the base plate and move it off into wherever. Actually scale it down like that. It's honestly just peace of mind. It's not going to have any specific effect in game, but in the studio, it just prevents it from being selected. And finally, if you want to add some cool effects to your parts, there's this effects tab right here. You can put on particles, some lights, sparkles, or maybe some fire if you want. I think I'll be going with some fire. You can see it right there. With all that out of the way, now we can move into getting the map kit. So assuming you don't, you haven't gotten the map kit in Roblox yet, what you're going to want to do is go to the home tab and click on toolbox. If you do have it already, you can click on this right here. It'll take you to my models and you should be able to find it pretty easily. But assuming you don't have it, you're going to want to go to the little shopping bag icon, go to models and type in F E M A P. So F E map kit. And you're probably going to want to take the first one, assuming it's by Crazy Blocks, because that's the creator of FE2, of course. And you're going to want to just drag it in there like you're moving apart. So when it comes to you, it will come in a group. Pretty much a group is a combination of multiple parts that can only be moved one at a time. And it also affects how you scale up and down. So you see... It's not, if I grab the up and down scale, it's not just scaling up and down, it's scaling out as well. 
So to ungroup, you're going to want to go to the Explorer tab and simply click on ungroup. So we're going to do this for the map making kit as well. By the way, for these two tabs, the Explorer tab allows you to see all of the parts of your workspace in your game. You're going to want to ignore most of these down here because this is for a regular game. Like if you're publishing just a standalone game. But since we're making just a map and not any of the scripts with it, we're simply just going to be working in the workspace for now. The properties tab, which is the one down here, allows us to see all the attributes of our part. So you can see by the appearance, we have the brick color, so we can switch it to one of the hexagon ones. Or if we want to be more specific with the color, say I want it to be just a little bit more green, I can simply drag it along like this in the select color. Gives us the, ma the material, how much it reflects the light, transparency, which determines how much you can see it. Some more data, such as what the part name is. The orientation of the part, which pretty much shows you where it is in the world. It also tell you what the position of it is in the world. This will be very useful when we're determining stuff like how the water moves in our world. Also some behavior such as anchored, you always want to make sure this is checked. If a part is can collide, it means you can like pretty much touch it. So if you uncheck it, you can walk right through it as if it's not there, but you can still see it. And finally, at the very bottom, we have the size of the part. If we want to adjust the size directly without having to mess around with the scale tool, we can simply do it like this. Now, back to the map kit. So what we have here are several objects that we're definitely going to be using with creating the map. First, we have the spawn region, which is effectively where you spawn on the map. Next, you have... This is optional. This is a wall jump. And I'm sure you know how they work. If you play Photo Escape 2, you just jump off of the wall. Next, we have some buttons. These affect the world, and pretty much you have to press all of them to complete a map. Also, to complete a map, you have to get to the exit, which includes this exit block, which closes when you get into the exit, so you can't escape. And finally, the exit region, which you have to touch in order to uh, win the game. There's also an air tank here, which gives you bonus air. You've seen it in maps like Crystal Caverns or Abandoned Facility. And finally, we're going to have to get rid of this intro here. We'll be going more about the intro in, I believe, the fourth episode. But for now, we're just going to ignore it. And we have here the water, which is set up in a specific way. It has an underscore water at the start of it. It is semi-transparent. And pretty much this acts as the actual water in the game. This is what you can swim through. If I were to duplicate this and call it something else, such as not water because it's not water, in the game, this would simply be a block that is that is can collide fall so you can walk right through it and it's semi-transparent so you can see through it but it doesn't actually act as the water in the game it just acts as a regular part so this would turn into water even though they look identical it's just the name and the conventions that they use so effectively you actually don't need any more of the map making kit you have all your parts and then it'll also give you some other parts in the explore tab such as some folders that will help with organization geometry Pretty much for all the parts of the map you can put there. Interactives for all the buttons as well as all the parts that are interacted by the buttons. You can use that to organize as well. And finally a settings tab which allows you to change how your map looks with the lighting. As well as determining what the background music would be. The difficulty and the image for the map when it's loading in. Finally it also comes with, a, with some instructions that are a must read if you're starting out. It's a, it's pretty lengthy, and it's a little bit out of date. For example, event string doesn't have any more restrictions. And you can actually use event script now, which we'll be going into in a later episode. But it pretty much gives you a basic rundown of a little bit more in-depth for how each of the objects work and how to get everything done. So with that being said, these are all the basic things you'll need to start making your map, and you can actually get started right now. But there's a few things I want to introduce you guys to, to pretty much make 
the process a little bit easier. So starting out, there's this thing in the test tab called the play here, which I really like. So if I'm so I'm gonna bring in one of my maps as an example. We have Mineshaft Madness here. Say I want to run around and test it out. So I just click on play. See, the problem is it will always spawn me in the very center of the base plate. So I'm not going to be able to run around in Mineshaft Madness and test it out. And a way to remedy this is to go into model and grab a spawn and just drag it out wherever you want. And this is where you'll spawn every time. But honestly, I'm not a huge fan of that. What I like to do instead is bring my camera to the place I want to start. Let's say I want to start messing around in the climbing section. So I go to test and I click the drop down for play and I click on play here. And what this will do is force my character to spawn at where my camera is. So now, despite the fact that we are very much outside the range of the basic spawn, I'm in Mineshaft Madness right now. Pretty much it's a very, it's a much quicker and easier way to start messing around in your map, assuming it's not directly in the center of the base plate, which typically it's not going to be. Another thing you can do is on the very rightmost tab, we have plugins. Plugins are pretty much scripts that other people have made that can perform specific tasks for you. Some of them are more elaborate than others. Um, I'm going to be linking all the plugins I talk about in the video in the description. But pretty much when you're in song plugins, please be careful and make sure that they're the reputable plugins that you're looking for. First of all, part counter is really nice. It actually doesn't help you build all that much, but it tells you how many parts are currently in your map. Which is a good benchmark for seeing how complicated your map is. Most of the time you want your map to be two to three thousand parts. Most of the maps in Fun Escape are maybe around 2,000. And pretty much the more parts you have, the longer it'll take to load in. There are some things here called Geom Tools. They're made by a user named Stravant. And pretty much they're just basic scripts that allow you to get some tasks done. They're pretty much what they say on the tin. So gap fill. Say I want to fill in the gap between these two waters with another part. Gap fill will do that for me. Resize a line, which is also a plugin by him, will allow you to resize the part to pretty much make it line up. It, it's pretty much just good for making everything look even. I haven't used it too much personally myself, but I know a lot of people who would definitely recommend using it. And finally, material flip. It does what it says. You pretty much click on a material and it'll rotate where exactly the material is facing. This is really good for if you're using something like wood planks where it has to be perfectly aligned and you want to make sure all the wood planks are going left or right but you randomly have one that's going up and down you can just use material flip to make sure it goes left to right a few more that i really like using building tools by f3x is it has a learning curve of its own but i've heard plenty of really really good things about it it pretty much replaces most of the model tab for what you'll do in studio and gives you a lot more control over your parts. It's a little bit more intuitive, but personally, I prefer using just regular studio. And finally, we also have build V4, which it doesn't exactly overwrite what you can do with the regular studio, but it gives you a lot of other opportunities and it gives you a lot of other cool tools. So for example, if I wanted to create a path, you can grab the path layer, select a part, and it'll essentially let us draw out a path with our cursor, which is really cool. I see another thing, it's a, there's a line connector tool, which essentially allows us to create a tightrope. So link to all these will be in the description of the video. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So. Now you know the basics of Studio and the map kit, and you should be able to get started with building your map in Roblox Studio. Next time, we're going to take an in-depth look at how FE2's buttons work, including how to place them, their effects, and how button functions work. Until next time, this has been Asada. See you soon.